Well, this morning we have the privilege of treading on a bit of hallowed ground as we examine one of the five solas of the Reformation in this Christmas season. Now, for some of you, I know that this term, the five solas, is a familiar one. Um, But for others of you, perhaps this is an unfamiliar term, and so let me explain what I mean by the five solas. Uh, Just give you a bit of a history lesson. Back in the 15 and 1600s, in the providence of God, there was a movement known as the Reformation that God used to raise up men. He raised up men like Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, Ulrich Zwingli, many other men, to stand up against the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church at that time and the perversion of the gospel that had been happening for centuries. And things came to a head in the early days of the 1600s when the offer of what was called indulgences was a popular practice. This was really at the heart of the controversy that moved Martin Luther to pin his 95 theses and nail them to the doors at Wittenberg. A man named John Tetzel was commissioned by Pope Leo X to go from town to town and to collect money and from village to village. Apparently, this man Tetzel was an excellent communicator and a very slick salesman. And so what he would do, he would go from town to town, dressed in his full papal gear, and he would stand and proclaim the offer of indulgences as he stood next to an erected cross. And he would proclaim fearful stories of of people's dead loved ones and family members, of the townspeople being in purgatory and undergoing intense punishment, and how they, those still living now, could help shorten the punishment of their dead loved ones if they would simply give some money to the Catholic Church. This is what was known as indulgences. It would help shorten their time of suffering and purgatory. As Tetzel would say things like this, he'd stand on the corner, do you hear the voice of your wailing dead parents and others who say, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me, because we are in severe punishment and pain. From this, you could redeem us with a small alms, and yet you do not want to do so. Open your ears as the father says to the son and the mother to the daughter. We created you, fed you, cared for you, and left you our temporal goods. Why are you so cruel and harsh that you don't want to save us, though it takes so little? Obviously, this was nothing more than just gross, twisted, evil attempt for the Catholic Church to raise money to build its huge and lavish cathedrals, and these were built on the backs of lies and and the guilt of family members who were guilted in to shorten the time of their family members' sufferings if they would just give a little bit of money. Now, this wasn't the only thing that was happening during this time, but it certainly seemed to be uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were. And so with the writing of the 95 Theses and the nailing of them to the doors of Wittenberg, as well as many other writings and ministries of various men, the Reformation was born, whereby this renewed commitment to the foundational truths of the doctrines of Scripture was had. And throughout the centuries, there has been a, a summation of what was taught during this time of the Reformation, and that summation is what we today call the five solas. Those five solas are this, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, and soli deo gloria. Our salvation is by scripture alone, by faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And to this day, it's these solas that represent and separate Protestants from Catholics. And it's that word there, that simple little Latin word, sola, that makes all of the difference. You see, Catholics then, and even Catholics today, would affirm that salvation is by Scripture, that salvation is by faith, it is by grace, it is through Christ, and it is to the glory of God. But it was that little word alone that made all the difference. You see, standing against the Catholic insistence that salvation depended on Scripture and tradition, the Reformers taught that salvation was by Scripture alone. The Catholics insisted that salvation depended on faith and works. The Reformers said, no, 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 the Scriptures teach that salvation is by faith alone. The Catholics said grace and merit. The Reformers said grace alone. The the Catholics said Christ and the sacraments. The Reformers said Christ alone. And the 
Catholics said, to the glory of God and the Catholic Sea Church. And the Reformers said, no, to the glory of God alone. And so as I mentioned in a recent business meeting, I, I, I wanted to think about these five solas for us during this Christmas season to draw our hearts and minds to worship the Lord and for the grace that he has shown to us. And I, and I entertained taking one sola for the next five weeks and just covering one per Sunday, and I realized very quickly that that was a fool's errand. So what we're going to do is just take one sola at a time, uh, Lord willing, for the next five years during the Christmas season, focusing on one at a time. And so for the next five weeks, we have the opportunity to examine what perhaps could be called the linchpin of them all, or the spoke at the center of the will of the five solas, and that is solus Christus. Our salvation is through Christ alone. Listen, each of these solas, they are interrelated. They are mutually dependent upon one another. You can't have one without the other, but solus Christus, that our salvation is through Christ alone, does seem to be kind of sitting at the center of all of them, connecting all of them into a single coherent theological system. You see, yes, we come to know the person and work of Christ only by God self-disclosing himself in the scriptures alone, yet God speaks through scripture not simply to inform us, but to do what? To save us through Christ. We're saved through faith alone, yes, but the object of our faith is who? It is Christ. We're saved by grace, the grace of God alone, no merit of our own, but the grace of God is shown to us in the person of Christ. And the ultimate goal of our redemption is God's glory, and yet ultimately God's glory, the radiance of God's glory, is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ our Lord. So you can see why J.I. Packer used this helpful analogy of a central hub that connects the spokes of a wheel when he wrote this. Christology is the true hub round which the wheel of theology revolves and to which its separate spokes must each be correctly anchored if the will is not to be bent. Or more recently, I love how Michael Reeves put it when he wrote this, the center, the cornerstone, the jewel, and the crown of Christianity is not an idea, it's not a system, it's not a thing, it's not even the gospel as such. It is Jesus Christ. And so this morning, through Christmas Day, like I said, we're going to examine this doctrine. This morning we'll examine the Christ, who he is in his human and his divine nature. Then the next two weeks, Pastor Kevin is going to help us consider the cost as we think about uh, Christ's atonement for our sins. That fourth week, we'll consider the control and ask this question, well, what is Jesus, the Christ, doing right now in his post-resurrection, post-ascension state waiting upon his return. And then finally, on Christmas Day, and yes, we will have service on Christmas Day. We addressed that at the business meeting, so you're all invited Christmas Day. We will have service. We will look at the current cultural and religious challenges to this specific doctrine and how God's word calls on each and every one of us to consider something, to consider what our response is to these crucial truths. So, that's where we're going. Before I read our passage here in Romans 1, let me note a couple of things for you that you're going to notice are different about your outline this morning in your bulletin. Number one, you'll notice that it's very long. There is a lot in there. And the second difference you'll notice is that it is all filled in. And no, that's not a mistake. That was intentional. Here's why. There's a lot for us to think on as we think about this topic this morning. I didn't want to have you so busy with filling in, I don't know how many blanks on that sheet, 30, 40, 50 blanks, and copying down all kinds of Bible references that you were so distracted trying to do that that you weren't able to just listen and hear the testimony of Scripture as to the nature of Christ. So you have everything filled in there for you this morning. Take additional notes if you want for sure, but it's all there for you to take home for private study. So I hope that you're able to just hear the Word of God and what it teaches us about the nature of Christ. Now, you might look at that outline and think to yourself, goodness gracious, we are going to be here forever this morning. You might even find yourself sympathizing with this meme that someone sent me yesterday. There's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> this is not going to be a hostage situation this morning. Uh, 
but it is going to seem a little bit like a fire hydrant of information. And I pray that in one sense that's intentional. I'm going to give the fire hydrant out there, and I hope that in the days to come, as you meditate on, reflect on, study God's word, that the Lord uses it to increase your love and devotion for this God-man, Jesus Christ. So let's uh, consider now, open up in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Each week, we're going to anchor ourselves in a different passage. We're not necessarily going to uh, exhaust that passage and, and exegete that passage as such, but we do want to anchor ourselves in that passage each week from the book of Romans. And this morning, we're specifically going to look at chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. I'm going to read the full paragraph just to give us context, and then we'll walk through our topic this morning. So look at Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And here's our key verses, verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Notice there in verses 3 and 4, you see these twin truths that we're going to discuss this morning. Verse 3, this son was descended from David according to the flesh. That's his humanity. And verse 4, he's declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. That is his divinity. So we're going to take these one at a time. First, in relation to this phrase that he was descended from David according to the flesh, we must remember, we must affirm that Jesus is fully man. He's fully man. Look here at the biblical evidence. There is clear, explicit biblical evidence for this. Number one, Jesus had a human body. Just like all human babies, he was born. In Luke 2.40, we see that he grows through childhood to adulthood, just like all of our little children here in this room do. Luke 2.52 actually tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He became tired like we do. We see this in the story of the woman by the well in Samaria in John 4. He became thirsty when he was on the cross in John 19. When he fasted for 40 days in Matthew 4, it tells us that he was hungry. At times, he became physically weak, like in his temptation in the wilderness after he had fasted. And it says that the angels had to come and minister to him. In Luke 23, and and we just looked in Mark as well, we see that Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry Jesus' cross, most likely because Jesus was so weak after the beating that he had received that he was not able to do it. Over and over again, we see explicit biblical evidence in the Gospels that Jesus had a human body. He was not some sort of angelic being. He was not some sort of demigod. Those near, near him saw him as a man. And as a man descended from the line of David. And in fact, I love how Wayne Grudem puts it when he writes this. For the first 30 years of his life, Jesus lived a human life that was so ordinary that the people of Nazareth who knew him best were amazed when he began to teach with authority and work miracles. He did not just appear to be human. He was a human Descended from David according to the flesh. Not only did he have a human body, but number two, Jesus had a human mind. The fact that he increased in wisdom shows us that he went through a learning process, just like all other children do. He learned how to eat. He learned how to walk. He learned how to talk. He learned how to read. He learned how to write. He did all of the normal progressions like any normal human being would have done. We see that he had a human mind when he speaks about that day in the Olivet Discourse, when he says concerning that day, the hour, uh, and the day, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son know that, but only the Father. So Jesus had a human body. He had a human mind. Number three, Jesus had human emotions. We see him exhibit a whole range of emotions throughout the Gospels. He marveled at the faith of the centurion in Matthew 8. He wept with sorrow at the death of Lazarus. He prayed with a heart full of emotion when Hebrews tells us that he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Over and over, the biblical witness is is crystal clear. Jesus was fully human. 
Now, there on your handout, you'll notice some important clarifications that we need to note. Number one, Jesus was fully God and, or fully man and fully God. This is what's known as the hypostatic union. This is important for us to remember and important for us to affirm because if we're not careful, we might wrongly think about these two different natures of Jesus as if he was maybe half God and half man. Because our math brains come into effect and we say, well, 50% plus 50% equals what? 100%. He was half and half, or maybe he was 75 or 25. But, but as with the Trinity, we find clear biblical teaching that both confounds our minds and confuses us. But nevertheless, we must affirm, and that is Jesus was not 50% God and 50% man, but he was 100% God and 100% man. This is something, as you go back and read church history, that was discussed and argued for hundreds of years in the early church. It, it finally led to an ecumenical statement being drafted and reached called the Chalcedonian Definition, at the Council of Chalcedon in AD 451. You see, through these 300 years leading up to this, there was all kinds of various views and erroneous views and heresies that had to be dealt with and debated. I know you're not going to remember all these, but just to tell you, there was uh, one called Apollinarianism, in which it was taught that Jesus had a human body, but he didn't have a human mind or a human spirit. Then there was Nestorianism that taught that Jesus was actually two separate persons within the same body, as if he were some kind of schizophrenic or something. He kind of switched from one to the other. And then there was Eutychianism that argued that Jesus actually had a third nature that was a combination of the human nature and the divine nature, and as such, he was neither truly God nor truly man. Now, all of that was circling on in these first few hundred years, and the solution finally came at the Council of Chalcedon in AD 451 for 23 days a whole group of church leaders gathered together to discuss this topic. Think about that for a moment. 23 days, probably eight hours a day, just hammering out scripture after scripture, passage after passage, thinking theologically, practically, biblically, how could this be that Jesus was both God and man? And a statement was reached then that has now been the orthodox statement for Christians for the last 600 years, 1600 years, excuse me. I'd encourage you to go look it up. But one helpful summary of the Chalcedonian definition is this, remaining what he was, he became what he was not. In other words, while Jesus remained what he was, fully divine, he had been that for all of eternity, he now in time became what he had never been, became what he was not, that is, fully human. He did not give up any of his divinity to do so. He did not give up any of his divine nature when he came to become a man. Instead, he took on something in addition to what he was. So it's important that we remember and affirm that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. Number two, it's important to clarify that Jesus in his humanity was sinless. He was sinless. It's important for us to note here as we think about his humanity versus ours, Jesus was perfect. He was entirely sinless for the duration of his life. He never committed a single sin in his lifetime. Now, some have objected, well, he can't have been truly human if he never sinned because to be a human, all humans sin, so to be a human, he must have sinned. This is an erroneous line of thinking because it fails to remember that Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned, they were what? Truly human. We see the sinlessness of Jesus taught throughout scripture. There's several uh, passages there on your handout, but let me read just one for you from the author of Hebrews in chapter 4 verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, now this topic of Jesus' sinlessness always brings up this question. Well, okay, Jesus didn't sin, but could he have sinned? Could he have sinned theoretically? I'm not going to spend any time discussing that this morning. <laughs> Wherever you land on that question, you, we have to affirm two very clear things. Scripture clearly teaches that Jesus was truly tempted as we are, 
And Scripture clearly teaches that Jesus never did sin. I'll leave it to you to come to the conclusion of whether he could have or not. Number three, clarification. Jesus will be a man forever. I think we're prone to forget this if we're not careful. Jesus did not give up his human nature after his death and after his resurrection. The resurrection accounts themselves. In John 20, he appears to the disciples as a man after his resurrection with the scars of the nail prints in his hands. Luke 24 said that he had flesh and bones and he ate food after his resurrection. In Acts 1.11, when Jesus is taken up in the ascension before the very disciples' eyes, the, angels tells, the angel tells the disciples this, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And then there in Revelation 1, chapter, or verses 13 through 17, we see that Jesus is still appearing as one like a son of man. Listen, Jesus Jesus did not take on humanity and then discard it 33 years later. Rather, he took on humanity and, in fact, even now remains fully God and fully man. Perfect, resurrected, glorified man, but man still for eternity future. Now, why does all of this matter? What does it matter for us if Jesus was fully man? Is it really that important that we say he was fully man, and fully God. Absolutely. Let me give you a few reasons here. The necessity of Jesus' full humanity. Number one, his humanity is necessary for representative obedience. That is, Jesus is our representative and obeys for us where Adam failed and disobeyed. We see the parallels between these two in Jesus' temptation in Luke 4 and Adam's in Genesis 2. The one obeyed while the other disobeyed. Paul puts it clear in Romans 5, verses 18 and 19, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience many will be made righteous. If Jesus were not human, he could not be our true representative. Number two, his humanity is necessary to be a substitutional sacrifice. If Jesus were not truly a man, he could not have died in our place and paid the penalty that was due for us as humanity. Hebrews 2, verses 16 and 17. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. That's us. Therefore, he had, notice that word there, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. The implication from that passage there, he had to be made like this, is that if he were not made like this, then he could not be a faithful high priest. He could not have made propitiation for the sins of his people. So his humanity is crucial, necessary for him to be our sacrifice, our substitute on that cross. Number three, it's necessary for him to be the one mediator between God and man. Because we were alienated from God by sin, we needed someone to come and to be a go-between between us and God. We needed a mediator who could represent us before God And there's only one person able to do that, the man Christ Jesus, fully man and fully human. Number four, it's necessary for him to be our example and our pattern in life. John tells us in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If Jesus was simply God and not human, that would mean nothing to us. How how could I walk in the model and the example and the pattern of, of God? Right, but he was not only fully God, but he was fully man. Number five, again, to be the pattern for our redeemed bodies. And Paul says that Jesus rose from the dead into a new body that was imperishable, raised in glory, raised in power, raised a spiritual body. His resurrected body is the first fruit, just the preview of what we have to look forward to in glory. When we would be welcomed in into eternity, when, when God the Father would raise the dead, would, would redeem us and glorify us in these resurrected bodies, Jesus' humanity now is the pattern for what that will look like for us in the future. 
And finally, number six, it is necessary for him to sympathize with us as a high priest. Hebrews 2 that we just read says that he is able to help those who have been tempted because he himself has suffered and has been tempted. The same point is made in Hebrews 4. If Jesus were God alone and were not human, we would say, well, you just don't understand, Jesus. You just don't understand what I'm going through. You have no idea what it's like to suffer like I'm suffering, to be tempted like I'm being tempted. If he were not man, we could say things like that. But the clear example of Scripture is that he knows fully what each and every one of us experience in the goods and the bad, in the high and the low. And so he is able to sympathize with us as our great high priest. So I hope you see here, it is absolutely necessary that Jesus Christ was fully man. Anything less than a fully man savior could not have atoned for our sins. But we must not stop there. If he were man alone and he were not God, that would do us no good, would it? And so we must equally affirm, go back to Romans 1, we must equally affirm that he is not only descended from David according to the flesh, but also, verse 4, four he is the Son of God in power. That leads us now to this second major truth, that Jesus is fully God. Let me go quickly through these here for you. Some explicit biblical evidence and claims. We see explicit biblical evidence. Number one, Jesus existed in eternity past. Think about John's opening words in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and, and without him was not anything that was made. He was there in eternity past. Number two, he created all things, and all things were created for his glory. We just saw that in John 1. You also see it in Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. By him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Number three, humans saw the glory of God in Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It was clearly evident as Jesus began his public ministry that this was no ordinary man. This was no ordinary prophet. This was the Messiah, the Son of God. Number four, he was confessed as God and he is the image of God. Think about Thomas's confession of him, my Lord and my God. Paul refers to him as the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Peter tells his audience that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ, referring to him as our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.3, one of my favorite verses in Scripture, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So not only do we have these clear, explicit claims, both from Jesus and the apostles, that Jesus is fully God, we also have biblical evidence, number two, that Jesus possessed attributes of deity that no mere human being could possess. He possessed omnipotence. Think about the stories of him stilling the storm with just a word in Matthew 8 multiplying the loaves and fish in Matthew 14, changing water into wine. All of these examples of his power demonstrate that he, like the Father, is omnipotent over all things in this earth. Number two, he asserts his eternality. When he says there in John 8, before Abraham was, I am, and when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega in Revelation 22, he's pointing us to the fact that just like the Father, he is not a created being. He is eternal from eternity past to eternity future. He demonstrated, number three, his omniscience. We see him demonstrate this like in Mark 2 when he knows uh, people's thoughts. In John 6, when from the first he knew those who would believe and those who would betray him, he had a special knowledge that was not merely human. Number four, he taught about his omnipresence. Now, we don't see his omnipresence put on display during his earthly ministry, but we do see him looking forward to the time when the church would be established, and we see him saying things like Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Or Matthew 28, 20, in the Great Commission, before he leaves the earth, he tells the disciples, promises them, I will be with you always, or I am with you always, to the end of the age. 
So Jesus, just like the Father, as fully divine, is omnipresent. Number five, he possessed divine sovereignty. In Mark chapter 2, we looked at that passage some time back, we see one of the strongest indications of Jesus' sovereignty, and it's one of the things that bothered the Jewish leaders so much. Remember that story there when the four paralytic friends, they bring their friend to Jesus, and the crowd is so bad that they remove the roof or make a hole in the roof, let the man down. And remember what Jesus does in that passage. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes were exactly right, weren't they? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus, in his declaration of the forgiveness of sins, is showing that very thing, that he himself is divine. Number six, he possessed immortality. Now, perhaps you ask, well, how did Jesus possess immortality when we know what happened on Calvary? He actually died, right? Remember Jesus' words to the Jews in John 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And in John 10, when he says, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Yes, Jesus died on the cross, but that death was never meant to be permanent. That death was never able to be permanent. Jesus laid his life down so that he would raise it up again. And number seven, finally, he is worthy of worship. Listen, this is something that is not true of any other creature, including angels. Only God is worthy of worship, and we read throughout God's word of creatures worshiping Jesus Christ. Just think about Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Right there in the middle of those verses, we read, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, listen to this, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Again, in Hebrews 1, 6, even the angels worship Jesus. He would not be worshipped if he were not God. So all of these things, his omniscience, his eternality, his omnipresence, omnipotence, uh, immortality, being worthy of worship, these are all just further proofs, proofs for us from God's word that he himself is God. Now finally, just as we asked with his humanity, let's ask now, well, why is this necessary? Is it necessary that he is not only fully man, which we saw it is, but is it necessary that he is also fully divine? Absolutely. Let me give you three reasons. Number one, if Jesus were not fully God, Scripture would not be inerrant. Listen, we've seen consistent biblical witness throughout the New Testament from Jesus himself to the apostles. They all agreed and taught the same thing, that Jesus is divine. No one with honesty can look at the Bible and come away saying that the Bible argues anything less than the full divinity of Jesus. So either we, we fully and unapologetically believe that Jesus was more than just a good man, that he was more than just a prophet, that he was more than just a good teacher, that he was actually fully God, co-equal with the Father and the Spirit, equal with God from eternity past to eternity future. Either we believe that or we must say the Bible is wrong at certain points. You cannot have both and. It is either or. Number two, if Jesus were not fully God, idolatry would be inevitable. What do I mean by this? Well, God's word is clear that God and God alone is to be worshipped. The very first of the Ten Commandments is a commandment to this very point, isn't it? You shall have no other gods before me. The Shema in Deuteronomy declares that there is one God and one God only. So what do we do with people worshiping Jesus as God and him not rebuking them if he wasn't divine? What do we do with the apostles preaching and teaching and leading Christians to worship Jesus if he were not equal to the Father? To do so would be nothing other than idolatry, would be nothing short of blasphemy. The full divinity of Jesus is what makes our worship possible. It's what makes our worship right. 
If he were less than divine, even a a, a minuscule amount less than the vine, he would not be worthy of our worship, and to worship him would be idolatry at its core. And finally, if Jesus were not fully God, our salvation would be impossible. Listen, no mere man could accomplish what Jesus accomplished. No mere man could fully and finally take the sins of his people and fully and finally appease the wrath of the Father against those sins for them. No mere man could earn a righteousness for his people so that it is imputed to their account by faith such that they are adopted as sons and daughters of God and welcomed into eternal fellowship with him. Only the God-man could accomplish such a wonderful and miraculous thing. And so this morning, as we begin this series, on Solus Christus, reminding ourselves that our salvation is through Christ alone. I think we have to start here by reminding ourselves, well, who is this Christ? Because if we don't understand who he is, then our, the fact that our salvation is through him alone means nothing. We must affirm that he was God, but he was not only God. He was man, but he was not only man. He was and is the perfect God-man the eternal second person of the Trinity who in God's perfect plan and at God's perfect time clothed himself with humanity in the incarnation, living a perfect life, dying a substitutionary death, rising victoriously to life, ascending to the right hand of the Father until he returns. This truth here this morning is the wonder, is the beauty, is the splendor of the gospel, and it's the truth that each and every one of us are called to believe and to hope in and put our trust in. So I pray this morning that as we prepare our hearts now to come to the Lord's table, to come and to remember his death and his sacrifice on our account, I pray for those of us who are here this morning who are followers of Christ. I pray that this are, these are fresh reminders to you of the nature of this God-man Jesus, whom you love, whom you follow, whom you worship, and whom you put your trust in. And if you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Jesus, my prayer is that the, the biblical evidence here is simply overwhelming to you and that you would see him for who he is, that you would see the need for you to repent of your sin and trust in him as the only one who is able to save you from your sin. There is salvation in no other. Our salvation is through Christ alone. Let's pray together.